Um, so welcome everyone to the Ruben Research Bytes camera version. Uh, my name is Margo Lopez. I'm a commissioning engineer for the observatory. Uh, the co-chair is Professor Stephen Ritz. And uh, today we'll hear from Andrew Bradshaw, Adam Snyder, uh, Heyoon Park, and Dan Weatherill on various aspects of the LSST camera sensors. Um, and uh, I will be monitoring the Slack and the Zoom chat for questions. Um, and Steve will be doing the timing and the slides. So uh, Steve, do you wanna go ahead and move on to the reminders? Yeah, welcome everyone. So just some friendly reminders. Uh, the uh, climate uh, some of us grew up in is a little different from the climate we're trying to create and continue here. Um, so please be mindful of the code of conduct um, and um, principles of kindness, trust, respect, diversity, and inclusion. But these are very important and they really help to create a space for people to have uh, an open exchange. Um, and uh, so let's all help each other um, continue that, make sure that happens. Um, so as you know, the vid uh, talks are recorded. Um, please try to show your appreciation. In um, typically we've been doing that in the Slack channels. Um, and as you know, there is a Slack channel dedicated to this uh, particular uh, session. Um, and as Margo said, she'll be monitoring for questions, uh, which will hold, I think to the end, this is supposed to be a lightning sequence of three minute talks. Okay, and uh, with that, um, our first talk is, uh, is by Andrew Bradshaw, um, who is uh, now at Slack. Andrew. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Bradshaw, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher working on the camera at Slack. I would just like to socialize distantly uh, the possibility for projecting flat fields as well as usefully structured scenes onto the focal plane during the final integration phase of the camera uh, starting next year. I'd like to thank my advisor, Aaron Rudman, for his ideas and support, as well as Hannah Pollock, an engineer at Slack who's been helpful with the CAD modeling. Uh, Johan Brejon and Josh Myers have also assisted with the optical modeling. Uh, basically, this idea builds on uh, pinhole projector images acquired during the first half of focal plane testing last fall, as well as a long history of using pinholes for commissioning, calibrate, uh, commissioning and calibrating cameras. Um, the starry pattern on the top of the image on the right is actually a uh, perspective of the kind of scene you can get from uh, projecting a scene across uh, the focal plane using a pinhole. This image was formed from illuminating uh, a simple office printer page with about a watt of light, uh, six, about six inches from, the, from a 500 micron diameter pinhole, and the exposure time was about 10 seconds. Uh, this raw image, uh, which was actually nearly a gigapixel before it was crammed into this slide, contains information about every pixel illuminated, including its size, shape, and response. We are proposing to take similar images during the final phase of camera integration next year. This image projector would live inside of the dark box shown at the bottom of the image on the right, alongside the narrow beam projector, the pencil beam, which will characterize the optical properties of the camera, including lenses. The dark box will have a little more than a half meter of clearance between the floor and the first lens of the camera, so not much space to work in, but uh, we would like to be able to, from this narrow space, fill the focal plane uniformly with light. In a, a minute space. left. Sorry to interrupt. About a minute left, Andrew. Thanks. And uh, yeah, so we would like to illuminate the entire focal plane with a uniform light uh, with as little optical aberrations as possible. This it lends itself to the pinhole design, which has no additional optics besides a hole in a box. So for narrow, build, narrow band flat fields, you can use a already, already available monochromator as the source of light, coupled with a larger, maybe 10 millimeter diameter hole. Uh, and this could uh, provide gain calibration on all sensors, as well as measurements of linearity and uh, tracking bad pixels, which are camera requirements. And for structured scenes, like the starry one you see on the top, uh, you can learn a lot about uh, additional CCD systematics and um, perform controlled astrometric 
experiments and uh, optical characterization, as well as perhaps uh, simulated observations before first light. So if you'd like to learn more about this or just chat about pinholes, uh, you can uh, ask me any questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Andrew. Um, I speakers, I'll just say ding when it's uh, when you got one minute left. Um, okay, so the next speaker is Adam, who has moved from Slack to Davis. So hopefully under exchange uh, between Slack and Davis, it's a positive interaction. Um, so uh, Adam, I'll say ding when you have a minute left. Unless he's getting his furniture. Yeah, if, if we could, if we could skip me, maybe come back. They're, uh, they're moving in uh, the bedroom and stuff. Okay, can, uh, very good. Hey, Yoon, you're up. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Heyoon Park. I'm a postdoc at Brookhaven National Lab uh, with Andre Nomarski as my advisor. I worked with LSST desk and camera project since um, 2015 as a Stony Brook PhD student and as a postdoc from this year. I handled and tested over 200 sensors at BNL during the raft production and studied the sensor anomalies um, such as true rings or charge transfer efficiency and how they affect the shape distortions. I've put the links of, of my uh, papers on true rings if you are interested. Uh, next page, please. Uh, my main work now is to handle, test, and analy analyze the commission in camera, ComCam. So in uh, this, February, this year, February, I visited Tucson, um, helped with the ComCam setups. I adjusted the spot projector as shown in the left side image uh, and measured the size and the shape of the spots. I also took the a uh, bunch of uh, flat images uh, changing filters. So as you can see on the right side images, you can put uh, three, fil three filters at once and change the filters. Uh, now Compton is in Chile um, taking images. I'm learning and developing tools to analyze the data. Uh, when this uh, COVID situation gets better, I really hope to uh, be on site in Chile and help. Uh, next page, please. Uh, not only ComCam, I'm also working on analyzing the uh, focal plane data. I was looking into both data with nine uh, raft images. Now we have uh, one minute. Okay. Now we have um, full focal plane uh, built in Slack. I'm really excited for the new data coming. I looked into a uh, gain stability check um, for last few months and found some possible issues with back bias voltage and temperature related to the gain jumps. Uh, also, I'm mapping the turings for the focal plane. So if anyone or DM needs the turing information, you can apply them. Uh, finally, I'm making pages um, to the uh, to track down the sensor history, I've linked it on the bottom of this uh, slide. So if anyone is interested, uh, please let me know. Um, you can look up what were reported with the sensors before in this page. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We'll do a round of applause for everybody at the, at the end. Um, uh, Adam, are you back? Okay, let's move on. Dan, if that's okay with you. Yeah, sure. Can people hear me? Um, it's very quiet. How's that? Better? So much better. Okay, worth it then. Um, should I start, yeah? Please. Uh, okay, so uh, hi everyone. For those who don't meet, know me, I'm uh, Dan Weatherall, postdoc uh, working at Oxford on LSST sensors and other silicon instrumentation for other projects as well. Um, today I'm going to briefly tell you a little bit about um, one of the parameters that we think affects uh, brighter fatter effect and um, brighter fatter effect um, uh, most people are probably familiar but this is an effect which uh, 
as a result of the asymmetric electric field structure in CCDs. Uh, and in particular, the CCD you can see in the top left there has uh, got a um, two directions, parallel and serial, we call them. Um, one direction, the uh, electric field is constrained by uh, patterned metal gates, and in the other direction, it's constrained by a, a strong implant. And that makes the field kind of squashy, squashier in one direction than the other. And this means that when charge accumulates in the pixel, um, that field uh, shape dynamically changes. As a result, pixel size slightly dynamically changes. And as a result, um, uh, charges that we think are in one pixel actually arrive in a, in a, in a different pixel. And this causes shape distortions. Uh, and some people think of this as a, a sort of uh, brightness dependent uh, PSF. Um, so uh, as I say, the asymmetry arises due to, due to the differences of these field structures. And a lot of work has been uh, going on to correct for the brighter fire effect uh, systematics, of course, uh, many people working on that. Um, but but uh, it's all, there are also operating parameters of the CCD that affect these things. And one of the most obvious ones is what we call CCD gate width. So I'm going to present um, some results from some testing we've done this year in uh, the OPMD lab at Oxford. But uh, unfortunately, COVID has thrown us a few months back. So this is not as complete as I'd like. Um, next slide, please. Um, so basically, to, to explain the background of this, on the top right there, you've got a diagram of the two directions in a, in a CCD, the parallel and the serial direction. Uh, and of course, all of this is uh, patterned at manufacture time. So you can't actually change the gate width, which is this uh, parameter L labeled there in the top right uh, diagram, um, because it's, it's a physical metal layer. Uh, but what you can actually do is uh, you can effectively change it by running with different numbers of gates energized during the integration phase, because the way the CCD is actually constructed is like that in the bottom left picture there, where it has a series of overlapping gates. You can choose to have one high, two high, or in the case of a four-phase CCD, three high during integration, if you like. So uh, in the E2V sensor, for example, that gives us a choice of a gate width of two microns, three microns, five microns, seven microns, or eight microns. Um, <clears throat> in general, as I said, um, from modeling and just from, um, from you know, some, some basic calculations, you can predict that the, uh, the parallel structure confines the, uh, the charge more weakly than the, uh, the channel stop implants. Um, and that's why the brighter fire effect is, in general, for most operating conditions, larger in the uh, uh, parallel direction. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so to, to spend a little bit more time on this, basically, you want to present about here. About 30 seconds. Stay in about 30 seconds. Sure. Sorry. The results we found uh, from one of our runs at Oxford, basically what we find is that you can reduce the slope of the brighter fire effect uh, coefficient by fairly substantial margin by uh, choosing the uh, get width accurately or correctly. And what we find is that five microns for E2V seems to work best. I can't tell you why, but it's certainly a big change. So it's worth looking into, we think. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks very much, Dan. Um, okay, Adam, are you back? Yes, I'm back. Sorry for that. Very good. Okay, I'll give you a one minute warning. I'm sorry, Dan, I was muted. I realized. Um, go ahead. Okay. Adam. Hello, everybody. I'm Adam Snyder. I'm newly graduated and uh, beginning a postdoc at UC Davis. And uh, most of my work uh, that I'm showing here is basically uh, continuations of some of the work going on at Slack and a little bit of what I'll be working on at using the Davis setup. So uh, the first sensor effect um, that I've been studying is uh, characterization of the focal plane crosstalk. And in particular, looking at nonlinearities that have started to be noticed in, during a lot of the earlier integration. So that's going to be work using this crosstalk projector pictured on the left, looking at the cryostat once we begin full focal plane testing, which hopefully shouldn't be too far off. And, um, and then using the Davis beam simulator to, to run similar tests and try and look at where the nonlinearities are occurring from. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then another sensor effect that I've been working on as well as looking at astrometric shifts and uh, distortions of the images of fake stars that have been projected onto the focal plane by matching the ideal projected image with, uh, or looking at the residual between the ideal projected image and what's detected using the DM stack software. You can then uh, disentangle the residuals into an optical component due to the optics of the projector and then in a component that is caused by the sensor and it depends on the location of the spot uh, illumination on the sensor. By taking many dithers, you can create maps of the, uh, for instance, the estimatic shifts, which is shown in the bottom right. So you can start to see features such as tree rings and the midline break. 
and uh, repeating this for multiple sensors and looking at shapes as well to, to see how the, the second moments are affected. Okay, next slide. And then finally, uh, and this was actually a lot of the work that was in my thesis, is a study of an effect called deferred charge, uh, in particular in the serial direction in ITL CCDs. So the charge transfer procedure by which the charge is clocked uh, from the pixel ray to the output amplifier isn't entirely efficient. And there seems to be multiple components that um, are contributing to the signal that's observed. So I've developed a, uh, a new set of software tools to do a forward simulation as well as a, uh, a correction algorithm to try and remove a lot of these deferred charge effects. As you can see on the right, if you look at the uncorrected versus the corrected, after application of the, uh, this new algorithm, we have been able to significantly reduce the number of uh, outlier ITL segments that lie above this five times 10 to the minus six goal uh, CTI value, which is the charge About, 30, about 30 seconds, Adam. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, right now my work is focusing on improving this to deal with a lot of the edge segments. So the segments that lie along the sensor edge, which are the most severely affected, uh, looking at noise, the inclusion of read noise and what that effect has. In particular, the uh, reversal of the read noise will change the correlations. And then finally, extending this analysis to looking at fake stars as well and uh, studying the brighter, fatter effect. All right, and uh, that's all I have. Okay, let's uh, give a big thanks to all the speakers. Thank you very much. And we have uh, time for questions. Margo. Yeah, um, just noting, so they just posted on the general slot that we're gonna transition at 11.15 since most of, most of the rooms are starting uh, right now at 10.45 with the flash talks. So we do have uh, extra time for questions if people are interested. So I see one question on the Slack so far from Simon about um, whether it's possible to project spot patterns with the pinhole setup. And uh, Andrew, do you want to give any more details on your answer to that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the you know artistic rendition slide that I had, um, the, the top is a pinhole image of a of art. You know, it's a woodcut. Uh, but you could put anything in there, including like a Hubble deep field image or a grid of spots or a grid of lines, um, anything that would help um, to characterize the, the pixels um, or their, you know, orientation to one another and, and things like that. So, uh, yeah, we could, we could use high resolution printed scenes, you know, um, printers can go up to, you know, a thousand or a couple thousand DPI. And so in a couple of inches, you already are getting up to um, as many pixels as uh, as the LSST has in its focal plane, so you can kind of tailor images um, to to whatever you like. What's the resolution in microns on the focal plane with diffraction? With diffraction? Yeah, you have to worry about diffraction at the pinhole or too large a pinhole. So, what's the smallest spot you can make? Um, that well, you. You can get, I'm proposing to do about a 10 micron pinhole um, with the brightest set of lights for, um, for scenes. And with that, you can, get, um, you can get resolutions on the order of about a tenth of an amplifier. Um, so oh, they'll gosh. be kind of fuzzy, but if they're high enough signal to noise, you can um, basically get whatever you like and you can you can model the diffraction as well so um, it actually provides information about um, the optics and the focal plane as well. A Andrew can you say a little more about where is the um, the image that you're projecting on, on your picture here is at the, at the bottom of that green box where, where is yes. it? Yes yeah at the bottom of that box or if more distance is needed you know you could use you could use the some mirrors and uh have a scene that's even further away okay yeah i mean this the, the it's purposefully left as kind of a question mark because the the size and scale is kind of something that, that i'm still working on and uh, kind of depends upon what kind of lights we can get inside of there let me uh, suggest a process a little bit of variation here which is uh, normally we would People would type their question and then uh, Margo would call on the person to ask the question interact. Since we have some extra time 
and since we're not that many people in the session, I think being a little freer is fine. That's okay with everyone. But let me strongly suggest uh, you have a question, please, and you feel you can't get it in in the freewheeling discussion, please type it and Marga will absolutely uh, make sure you are heard in a timely way. Does that sound okay to everybody? Okay. Yeah, and I, and I just wanted to emphasize that, you know, this is a very, very much a, a work in progress. We have um, maybe a couple of months to put this, put this together. At the very least, like a flat field should be very simple to do with a large, um, large aperture and um, the given um, monochrometer light source that will be available with the pencil beam inside of the dark box. So we'll be able to get monochromatic flat fields. That was the original goal, but uh, why not with the same box use a smaller pinhole and um, some scenes and get some information onto the focal plane that then make it use to calibrate the camera. So I have a question for Dan. Um, when choosing the gate width, um, kind of nothing comes for free. So if you choose five micro, I mean, what, what do you, what are the trade-offs there? If you choose uh, the gate, what, do you, what are you losing? Or well, so there's a couple of things that spring to mind. Um, now, the first and most obvious is power. But of course, if you're, you're already using a larger gate width, for example, that's actually a, a, a win rather than a loss, okay? So you've taken an extra half CV squared every power, two half CV squareds every parallel readout to, to charge and discharge a different uh, capacitance, right? But that's uh, something of a minor trade-off. The major trade-off is full well capacity. Um, now it's actually somewhat complicated because, you know, it is the case, it, you know, one would think a bigger gate width means higher full well in, the, in terms of bleeding full well. And that's generally true, but that's, only true if the image clock voltage is also optimized to reflect that, right? So it's, it is not, I mean, so this test I've showed you here actually is, is all of the voltages are all the same. And if you actually were changing the gate width in a, and re-optimizing a whole system, you would, you would probably find a slightly different optimum image clock level in terms of where the uh, blooms full well crosses the surface full well. Um, now, so yet you're absolutely correct in saying that it's not totally for free, but of the options you have, for operating parameters that actually change the Breyer fatter effect coefficients, this seems to be the, the least costly one to fiddle with, right? Because the others would be bias voltages, um, basically. And that's, that's, you know, you're messing with a, a, a real lot of stuff if you start uh, fiddling with those. But certainly the full well is a real concern if you, you know, if you decide to, to, to mess with this. Can you give me an estimate on how much you sacrifice in full well? Well, I, what I don't know is, uh, I, I do confess, I don't know what we actually use in the current plan timing sequence uh, as far as gate width goes. So if, you, if, you, if you're currently using a smaller one, then you actually will gain full well. Now, the full well specification for the LCT camera is quite complicated. It's actually based on not overloading the rev electronics rather than how many electrons we can hold in the pixel. We, we, I, as far as I know, and someone more integrated in the, the camera team can correct me on this. I don't think we actually ha ever really have a problem with the amount of electrons we can hold in the pixel. So for that reason, I, I, I do think this is worth thinking about. And I mean, I wish, you know, had we not been shut out of the lab for five months, I could have told you this a bit earlier, but um, I, I, I mean, I know what Craig also is in the chat has looked at this before I know, but um, you know, we're seeing quite a strong effect here. And so I, I do think it's worth thinking about whether we're using the right gate width or not uh, as, you know. Um, I think we currently have two uh, uh, gates high during integration. So yeah. the five microns is the correct. Exactly. So it's the correct choice. Um, yeah. Although on the E2V, um, you know, that could be two could be either. Uh, well, no, it's three and two is always five, right? So yeah, it's five. Yeah. And so the question would then be, what do we do on the ITL, I guess? Um, two, two also. So we get, you know, 6.67 or something. Yeah, yeah. So in other words, like this is all taken care of. But it's interesting to to note that it does have quite a strong effect. We have um, another question come in from Robert on the Slack. So he was asking Adam Snyder, 
How well does the CTE model separate traps on the serial from every transfer classical CTE? Um, and how are the two components separated? Uh, Adam, did you want to address that? Uh, yeah, I can address that. Um, the model itself has a term for global charge transfer efficiency, which is, is the per transfer efficiency that you normally uh, think of when, when you're discussing CTE. Um, it seems that for the case of the ITL, there's the additional component due to a, some sort of localized trapping that's occurring at a specific location early on in the serial register. So they're modeled separately and it's not shown here, but in actuality, when trying to distinguish the two, it is a difficult process because they can have degeneracies. Um, and a lot of time, that's one of the big struggles, but how I usually try and do it is to pick a regime in which the localized charge trapping is not a substantial component of the CTI. And then by looking at the signal in the overscan from the EPR measurements, you can then uh, break that down into primarily due to the global CTI, and then look at what remains, if you take into account just global CTI, what is the residual trapping at the at further signal regimes. Um, and if you look at the results of those, uh, a lot of times I've found that I've underestimated the localized charge trapping and overestimated the global CTI. So uh, I guess that is uh, what I prefer to have rather than to overestimate one and the other. And then another important thing to note is I'm not correcting the global CTI because that is, you can only measure the accumulation of that effect over the entire transfer. So you can't really invert it, even though there is a model for it by which I could in fact apply some sort of uh, operator that would invert the average of that process. Since I can't measure it exactly, I don't think it's necessary to correct that. But the local effect you can actually uh, measure because you know exactly that it occurs once and you can get an estimate of how much charge redistribution is occurring. So there's a little bit of nuance that goes into distinguishing these, these different ones. Um, and it's actually what is impacting the edge segments the most is because they're very degenerate so I'm almost always underestimating the amount that is uh, uh, being trapped and just uh, overestimating the, the global component. Thanks, Adam. Just a reminder, we have about 15 minutes before we're gonna switch a little bit of extra time because of the technical difficulties. So feel free to type your question um, or cut in verbally on the conversation if you have more questions for the speakers. Well, if we have time, I'll ask Adam the rest of the question, which I didn't get a clear answer to. What is the smallest spot that you can project? Because you were talking about projecting scenes and about characterizing the devices. So one of the things I would like to know is what the point source bleed level is, for example, which means that you have to put spots down that are of order two pixels across. So I think that's hopeless, isn't it? So what are the things you can measure using this, or maybe I got the numbers wrong. You said you could get down to a tenth of an amplifier, which is 50 pixels or 500 microns. That seems very large, but I don't know what your, you know, your ratio is. That was Andrew who said that, I think. Andrew, I mean, oh, sorry. Adam also showed yeah. Yeah. this. So sorry, I'm not good at names. Uh, I'm Robert. Okay, I'll let Andrew take that. Sorry, one. Adam. I, both begin with A, you know. Yeah. Um. Uh, that's that's uh, something that I'm still working on. You know, this is um, uh, a, a work in progress. So I can't give you any definitive numbers other than, uh, you know, it's you know I, I've got a working optical model um, that that I'm just doing straight ray tracing with right now. So um, I, I haven't generated any images, you know, uh, of like intensity patterns just yet, but but I'll certainly let you know when I do, because that will be interesting. So just ray tracing, what's the geometrical projection of the pinholes? 10 micron pinholes, so what does that project to in microns on the on the CCD? Uh, little more than 10 microns, yeah. Um, it's, um, 
yeah, it's it's magnified just just a little bit, but not but not by much. Okay. Yeah, I'd appreciate uh, any thoughts that you have about this. This is uh, useful to. So the to light discuss. source is a significant distance behind the pinhole. Then is it? In the in the current pinhole projector, it's on the the roof of the box, on the ceiling of the box, um, pointed downward. But it could be done by th by transmission as well. I think instead of reflected light. Mm -hmm. Robert, getting back to Adam's uh, presentation, it is possible to project a several micron spot uh, using the UC Davis system. So yeah. investigations of subpixel are possible. Yeah, I knew your system could, Tony. That's why I was asking what um, this SAC system could do, because it can eliminate the whole camera. Yeah. So maybe we'll do different things in different places. Yep. Yeah, I, I will mention that with the spot projector that produced these images that are shown here, we, we could not get even smaller spots than about three or four pixel full width half max, which I think is one of the motivating factors for Andrew's new um, optical design to try and get smaller spots than that. And, and that primar primarily had to do with the limitations of how big of a commercial lens we could fit underneath the focal plane without coming dangerously close to the uh, the, the the window, uh, you know, with all the safety concerns there. Thanks for jumping in, Adam. That's why I was holding the slide for you. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe just so people can know it, if there aren't, are there other questions, Margo? I don't see any, but it's hard for me to see all the windows. Um, since we have this slide up, I was wondering if Hyun and uh, Adam care to comment so the people listening in who haven't seen these before, uh, you want to just state what the typical amplitude of the tree rings is for, for the sensors on the focal plane, roughly? Um, I don't really have good numbers on the, the flux variation. Um, at least measured here, you can see that the uh, centroid shifts by them are, are quite small, it looks like, at the 0.02 level or lower. Uh, I think Heyun knows more about the, the flux variation. Uh, it's something I've been working to try and measure using the same residual technique as to diddler spots and measure how their flux, the fluxes of spots vary as they pass, but I haven't been successful yet. Uh, yeah, I can add to that. So uh, with the <clears throat> that bias voltage for 50 volts for ITL and 70 volts for E2V. Um, average amplitude for the trims were less than 0.1%, uh, like 0.04 uh, in my record. Thank you. So we I was going lucky. to ask a similar question to the same person, which is <clears throat> there was some work done by um, some of Adam's students on the random fluctuations in the pixel sizes. We were seeing numbers like 0.4%, I think, RMS. This is just the ragged gate effect. Do we have a feeling now we've looked at all our production sensors, how much um, variability there is in effective pixel size? I think... Uh, are you talking about Michael Bomber's work? Yeah, Michael's where, work. Yeah. Okay, where he, uh, yeah, basically credited all flux variations within the flat field as being due to pixel variations and was able to come up with a number. Yeah. I, I don't actually know if that exact analysis has been repeated on the focal plane, so I, I can't give a, an exact number. Yeah, you um, need quite a high signal to noise, but it's an interesting number because he was only a factor of two or something below it beginning to be a problem. Yeah, the conclusions of the study were that it shouldn't just just the random pixel variations wouldn't be a problem as long as the the CCDs 
kind of retain that quality. Um, but there was some worry that since that was a, an early unit that was actually quite good quality, that once they started to kind of mass produce them, there might be some drop. That's um, why I wanted the number on the actual ones we've got in the focal plane. Yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't actually, I don't think that has, I don't think we have a, a number generated for that. Um, there are like PRNU numbers that have been part of a, the regular EO test, but um, mm -hmm. not not something that I can yeah say like they vary within a certain percent. Um, okay. If if that's something yeah if that's of, of interest, I, I'm sure we can look into it during the EO test period because we're going to be going to be taking a lot of data for that. Um, to do something like that, you need a large, like an extremely large set of flats. I, I think we called them ultra flats, which were like upwards of 100 or more flats. Um, and it, it might be included already as part of the plan procedure, but I'm not sure. Uh, and something I can look into. You just need the signal to know it. Um, and then I think yeah. we stopped believing that we could get a 2D field from a 1D field. So it's just the statistics that are interesting. Yeah. Mind. We've got a little less than 10 minutes if anyone has any more questions for our speakers. We can also give people a five or 10 minute break. Yeah, also feel free to leave. <laughs> just to comment, sorry, just to comment on what Robert said, um, there are um, one dimensional variations as well as two dimensional in the sense that the, there are stepper uh, hiccups um, on all the all these devices, but that's a one-dimensional issue, and and none of these things are changing, <laughs> hopefully, unless you melt the silicon. Oh come on, yeah, and the PRNU. If since we have time, um, you have to be a little careful what this what spatial scale one looks at. Obviously, yeah. the other yeah. are wavelength dependent as well, coding non-uniformities and so on, particularly at shorter wave blue end. Mm -hmm. As Robert knows, uh. <laughs> those also won't change uh, until it starts peeling off the coating the way it did on oh, the. Oh, come now! <laughs> All right, no, I don't think that's going to happen, Steve. <laughs> Well, and just a note for attendees that some of the other rooms have changed their Zoom link, and that can be found in the general Slack channel. And I believe Melissa is working on updating the website links right now as well. So if you are, depending on which session you're going to join next, um, they're going to start at 11.15. And using the day two RRB general Slack channel is the most accurate way to get the links. So let me suggest we thank all the speakers again very much. Thank you. And congratulations, Dr. Snyder, for defending your thesis recently. And thank you. Uh, I suggest maybe, what do you think, Margo, we'll end this Zoom session. Um, and, and Or we should verify that the next session is in the Zoom, at least. Yes. OK. Okay, thanks all. Thank you. Bye -bye. I'm sorry I missed your defense, Adam. I was off by an hour. Uh, but his thesis will be available soon. Yeah, I'm going to, once I have a final draft, which should be fairly soon, I'll, I'll I think there was some recommended, I could get it posted in desk or somewhere. And it'll also be available through uh, Stanford Libraries. Okay, great. Bye. Bye bye. So, Marga, we should not be using the website. We should be looking at the Slack channel. Uh, our link hasn't changed. So for us, it doesn't matter. But for people looking for other links, some of them have changed. Mm. So using the Slack channel to use the to get the Zoom link for which other talk to go to. And she's refer Melissa is referring to something called slot three. Don't we have slot one and slot two, but not slot three? Oh, those Where are slot. Oh, those are. I'm sorry. 
I'm, um, we're in slot three, which is the RRB. Got it. No, this is two. We're slot 2A, technically. So right. slot two refers to the time of day, and we are the eighth parallel talk. While we're waiting five minutes, uh, speakers, how would you like me to give you a warning? Sorry for my kludge, either 60 second or 30 second ding. Um, what would be better for you? Would that be okay? Margot, any suggestions? I don't like to interrupt people while they're speaking. But it's also hard to look at visual cues while you're speaking, so. Absolutely. All right, I'll just say ding. I think one thing I saw that we might want to consider is, um, like to mark when you're running out of time, is, is I've seen people like draw on the slide that they're showing, like say like, like a, like over, so like when you're looking at the slides, you can annotate it. I've seen people like draw in the corner, like like heads up or something. Or a cane, you know. Yeah, I don't know. They have that little looks... stamps with like a star and a check mark and things like that. Oh, that sounds, uh... yeah, but I don't know if you can do it while projecting. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. oh, I see. So you're saying I could just start moving the cursor around. Uh, no, you'd have to actually like stamp a star or a check mark or something. Right, in but the can you see my cursor? No. Really? Oh, bummer. But when you I share don't... the screen, I can see your cursor. You can? Yeah, I can. But oh, right no, now, I'm, I'm not sharing the screen right now. Okay. No. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. Can you see my cursor? Yes. So why don't I just start doing this when you have one minute left? <laughs> and then the speaker can acknowledge they see it and then he can stop doing it. Right. <laughs> the fourth time through, we'll get this absolutely right. I've often felt the next time we build the uh, Rubin Observatory, we'll know exactly how to do it. <laughs> yeah, second time's the charm. That's true with every project, of course. And when you do a space mission, you actually give some thought before launch to suppose we have a really bad day, what's our first move? So that's a, that's a different realm from where we are. Any adjustments you'd like to make, Margo? I don't think so. I see a couple people trickling in. Welcome, welcome. We'll get started in two minutes. And then we go until quarter of, I guess. Yeah. So we're eating a little bit into the break, which was supposed to be half an hour, but now is 15 minutes. All the good snacks and coffee will be gone. Okay. <laughs> Bummer. Yeah, we should have sent out those like Thor Labs Lab Snacks care, kit, care kits to everyone who registered. Break snacks. Just give it one more minute.
I have 11.15 now. All right. See, people are still trickling in a little bit, but we should go ahead and get started to respect the timeline. So welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Margo Lopez. I am a commissioning engineer for the Rubin Observatory. Uh, the co-chair is Professor Steve Ritz. And today we're gonna hear um, from Andrew Bradshaw, Adam Snyder, Heyoon Park, and Dan Weatherill on some various aspects of the LSST camera's uh, sensors. And I will be monitoring both the Slack channel and the Zoom chat uh, for questions. So please go ahead and type in your questions. We are gonna wait until the end of the talks for the Q&A. And um, Steve will be doing time and running the slides. Yeah, thanks. Uh... Margo, thanks everyone for joining. Um, just a friendly reminder about the Code of Conduct. Uh, it really takes all of us together to help ensure we maintain a welcoming, kind, uh, respectful um, climate and to help to foster diversity and inclusion. Um, and so these reminders here, I think are really helpful to all of us and uh, we will certainly be mindful of them throughout the session. And we appreciate your um, working with us on that very much. Um, uh, the session's being recorded, I think you know. Uh, we'll give people a chance to thank the speakers at the end. Um, and uh, as Margot said, please post your questions in Slack or in the chat on Zoom. And um, I think the way we'll work given the number of people is maybe Margo will call on people and they can ask their questions. Um, and then we can allow a little bit of follow up. Okay, I'll be giving the speakers a one minute warning by moving my cursor, moving the cursor around. Um, so first up is uh, Andrew Bradshaw from Slack. Andrew. Hello all, my name is Andrew Bradshaw, and I'm a postdoc working on the camera at Slack. Uh, for this Rubin Research Bytes, I just wanted to socialize the idea of projecting flat fields as well as structured scenes onto the focal plane during the final phase of integration of the camera um, starting next year. I'd like to thank my advisor, Aaron Rudman, for his ideas and support, as well as Hannah Pollock an engineer at Slack who has been helpful with the CAD modeling. Johan Brijon and Josh Myers uh, also assisted with the optical modeling. The basic idea of this uh, builds on uh, pinhole projector images that we acquired during the first half of focal plane testing last fall, as well as uh, a long history of using pinholes for commissioning and calibrating cameras. On the right hand side of the slide and this uh, kind of artistic rendering of the setup, uh, the starry pattern at the top is a perspective of the kind of scene that you can project across the focal plane using a pinhole. This, that image was formed using a uh, simple printer page, office printer page, and uh, it was illuminated by about a watt of light and the light then passed through a 500 micron diameter pinhole six inches away from the printer page. And the exposure time was about 10 seconds. And this raw image, which was actually about a gigapixel before it was crammed into this slide, contains information about every pixel, including its size, shape, and response. So we're proposing to take similar images during the final phase of camera integration next year. This uh, pinhole projector would live inside of the dark box at the bottom of the image on the right alongside a narrow beam, which will characterize the optical properties of the camera, including its lenses. The dark box will have a little more than half a meter of clearance between the floor and the first lens, so not, not a lot of space to work in, but we would also like to be able to fill the entire focal plane uniformly with light in a controlled fashion in under 10 minutes with as little opt optical aberrations as possible. So this, this kind of lends itself to a pinhole design, which has no other optics besides a hole in a box. Um, so for the narrow band flat fields, you can use, we, we can and plan to use an already available monochromator as the source of light with a much larger aperture, about 10 millimeters in diameter. The goal of projecting these flat fields would be to check system requirements before shipping, including gain calibration on all sensors 
uh, measurement of the camera response linearity and identifying and tracking bad pixels. These are camera requirements that need to be verified. And um, for the more interesting structured scenes, you could use a much smaller pinhole coupled with much brighter lights. Uh, we're proposing um, perhaps hundreds of watts and a pinhole 10 microns in diameter or smaller. And uh, the images could be uh, any sort of scene printed with a high resolution printer, which you know they can be thousands of dots per inch. Um, and uh, this can provide structured information on the focal plane that we can use to characterize each pixel, perform astrometric experiments, and, uh, and also an optical characterization check, and also uh, more generally just simulate observations before first light. So if you have any questions or want to chat more about pinholes, uh, please hit me up. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks very much. Next, uh, next presentation is by Adam Snyder. Hello, everyone. I'm Adam Snyder. I was a graduate student working at Slack on the uh, camera integration and testing. I'm now going to be a postdoc working at Davis doing uh, similar studies. So I'm um, just to highlight a couple of the uh, different camera sensor effects. I'm going to start with one known as electronic crosstalk, which is a lot of what I'm going to be working on at Davis, and this is studying not only characterizing the crosstalk across the uh, heavily segmented focal plane of the LSSD camera, but also looking at possible nonlinear signals that are occurring at different stages of the readout electronics. So using a projector on the left uh, at, the slack, at Slack for the bot full focal plane integration and uh, future images with the Davis beam simulator. Uh, next slide. And then the second uh, camera sensor effects that I've done a lot of work and then continuing to work on is uh, mapping pixel area distortions that cause astrometric shifts and shape distortions. So things like tree rings, uh, segment boundaries, and basically using a projected image of spots um, and then comparing the residual measurements between the ideal projected image and what is actually detected by the uh, using DM the science pipeline to do the calibration. And then by looking at these residuals and removing the component that is due primarily to the projector optics that are used to project the fake stars. Uh, then looking at what remains uh, in terms of X, Y shifts and distortions in the second moments in the X and the Y direction. So there's an example on the bottom right where you can start to see the, the effect of tree rings on the uh, centroid of, of fake stars. Okay, next slide. And then finally, um, the last sensor effect, okay, one minute um, that I'm looking at is deferred charge. And this is actually a major component of my thesis, uh, looking at serial deferred charge in ITL CCDs and developing software tools by which to simulate this effect and to reverse it uh, in order to apply a correction. So as you can see on the right, um, the effect of uh, this new algorithm on the corrected or on the ITL segments is to dramatically reduce the number of outlier segments that have poor CTI properties. And uh, my future work is studying the impacts of noise, um, noise correlations on the correction algorithm and improving it using spot uh, projector images and looking at uh, segments that lie on the edge, which are most afflicted. Uh, yeah, feel free to ask me questions about any of these. Uh, during the Q&A. Thank you very much, Adam. Great, right exactly on time. Uh, okay, thank you very much. The next uh, speaker is Hayden Park from Brookhaven. Hi, Hi everyone. Um, my name is Hayden Park. I'm a postdoc at Brookhaven National Lab. I, oh, wait, my advisor is uh, Andre Nomarowski. I worked with LSST desk and camera project since uh, 2015 as a Stony Brook PhD student and as a postdoc from this year. I handled and tested over 200 sensors at BNL during the ref production and I studied the sensor anomalies like um, tree rings and charge transfer efficiency and how they affect the shape distortions. I posted um, two links for the papers on tree ring study uh, if you're interested. Next page, please. 
My, my main work now is to handle, test, and analyze the commission in Canara CONCAM. I've visited uh, Tucson in February this year. I helped uh, adjusting the spot projector as shown on the left side image uh, and measure the size and ellipticities of the each spot of the spot images. We also took a bunch of uh, flat images using different filters. So as you can see on the right side image, uh, you can put three filters at once and change the filters uh, remotely. Now CONCAM is in Chile and taking images. I'm learning and developing the tools to analyze the data. And if, uh, if or when the COVID, this COVID situation gets better, I hope to come to Chile and help to handle the camera for the commission. Uh, next page, please. So not only CONCAM, I'm also working on analyzing the worker plane data. I was looking into both data with nine graphed um, images. Now we have full focal plane built in Slack. I'm excited to have new data coming. Um, but so far I investigated the gain stability check and found some possible um, issues with the back bias voltage and temperature uh, inst instability related to the gain jumps. Um, currently, I'm mapping the two rings on focal plane. So if anyone's interested, um, if DM needs the two rings information, uh, I can, you can apply them. And finally, on the bottom of the slide, I placed the link for the Confluence page I'm posting for the sensor history. So if you want to track down the sensor, uh, like what was reported before, uh, you can use that page. Okay, so if you're interested, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hayun. Thank you. Uh, and next up, we have uh, Dan uh, Weatherall from Oxford. Dan. Hi, hi everyone. <clears throat> For those who don't know me, I'm uh, Dan Weatherall, postdoc at Oxford, working on uh, LST instrumentation and some other instrumentation projects. Um, today, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about uh, the brighter fatter effect and, and one of the particular CCD operating parameters that, uh, that has some impact upon how big it is. Um, so basically, the brighter fatter effect is uh, arises as a result of uh, the uh, confining electric fields in the CCD being defined differently in the two directions as parallel and serial. So in, in the serial direction is defined by a fairly strong uh, um, channel stop uh, implants in the, in the device and in the parallel is defined by patent metal gates, um, which give a, a somewhat weaker confinement in the electric field. So what this results in is when some charge is stored in a pixel, um, the, uh, the electric field shape inside the pixel dynamically changes slightly. Uh, and that means that the pixel size uh, dynamically changes. And so we get uh, shape and size distortion effects, which could be uh, some people regard as a, something of a signal dependent PSF, which is a bit of a problem for, for example, uh, uh, galactic shear measurements. So um, I, I'm going to present just the brief measurements we did uh, this year in the OPMD lab at Oxford uh, uh, on a parameter called gate width. So next slide, please. Um, so basically, uh, the gate width there on the top right uh, diagram is uh, is the parameter L. It's basically how wide the parallel uh, metal gate is on the CCD. Now, of course, that's defined at manufacture time. You can't actually change it. Um, but a CCD, as you see in the bottom left picture there, is constructed of uh, overlapping gates in a parallel direction. And so what you can do is you can choose how many gates you energize during readout. And this effectively changes the gate width. Um, uh, the two types of CCD in the uh, um, LCC uh, camera focal plane um, for the E2V sensor, which we, we tested at Oxford, the, you have the choice of two, three, five, seven, or eight microns. Um, in general, we, we expect the parallel gates to, uh, to arrive weaker confinement, as I said, and so the, bound, uh, the boundary shifts in the parallel direction are bigger than the serial in most operating conditions. And indeed, that's what we find for the brighter fatter effect. Um, next slide, please. Um, so what I'm presenting here is, is, is a result we've, uh, we've taken uh, recently from Oxford. And what we've done is we basically just studied the uh, uh, the difference between uh, changing the gate width only and not changing uh, changing as little else as possible. What we find is actually the, the gate width, as expected, has a, a fairly large impact on the size of the brighter fatter coefficients. Uh, and indeed, what we find for the E2V sensor, at least, is that the five micron choice of gate width is, is the best in terms of having the lowest um, uh, brighter fatter effect uh, coefficient slopes. 
Um, so um, this is seems to be true across many channels and uh, also across different back bias conditions. So we think that this is the, the correct way to operate. Um, and uh, anyone has any uh, questions or whatever, I'll, I'll try and hang around the Slack, et cetera. Um, thanks very much. Okay, thanks very much, Dan. And let's uh, thank all the speakers, either virtually or thank you very much. So we have um, a couple of questions coming in um, and uh, let's start with Meredith. So Meredith, did you want to unmute and ask your question? Sure, uh, this is for anyone who wants to uh, take it. Uh, I'm wondering what has been most surprising for you between how you expected LSTCAM to behave versus how it's actually behaving? And then uh, as a kind of a follow up to that, what are you most looking forward to investigating once ConCam is actually in Chile on the telescope? I can make a comment on things I've found interesting in LCD camera specifications, if that's relevant. Um, the thing I found most interesting over the, the few years I've, I've spent some time on this is um, is how we is the specification for full well capacity in the LCD CCDs, which was driven in LCD's case uh, by um, requirements downstream rather than uh, requirements upstream in terms of actual uh, electron full well capacity, as it is in most of these things, um, and that. You know, and uh, full well capacity is something that varies very strongly with even minor changes in the doping profiles of CCDs. And so, you know, we've, we've had times when, when it's changed quite rapidly and it's affected by basically anything else you touch in the CCD. So it's um, one of those things that I think we will have to keep an eye on as we go forward, uh, testing the, um, the commission camera and uh, indeed the, the final focal plane. We optimize for everything else. We've got to make sure we keep the full well um, where it needs to be. Uh, hey, Yen, did you have anything to add about um, what you're looking forward to investigating once ComCam is on the telescope? Uh, so, so far I had some like issues with the um, um, images uh, analysis. So I'm interested in like applying the what was already done from SLAB to ComCam also to analyze the electro optics. Um, yeah, currently having a little um, issue with the buckler's files, but um, yeah, I, I think that's the thing I want to, to add. Uh, awesome, thank you. Uh, so we have a couple of questions that came in for Andrew as well about the pinholes. Uh, the first one from Colin, how flat is a pinhole flat and what's the dominant source of non-flatness? And then also, uh, can you translate that in X and Y or is it sort of fixed in the center? Yeah, thanks, good questions. Um, how flat is it? Well, we can, look at the, um, we can look at the flat field images that came off of the nine ref testing that we did before and they're, they're very flat uh, across um, the rafts that we could look at, um, the the difference in intensity from the edge to the center is uh, under 10 percent, and uh, the dominant source of that non-flatness in theory is um, just uh, relative to the thickness of the pinhole. If you could have that the you know the substrate that the pinhole is poked in or lasered in or whatever, if you could have that substrate be extremely thin, you could have very flat. Um, images all the way out to however far you like, but um, the, the thickness, the finite thickness provides some edge roll off. And um, as for moving it around, yeah, absolutely. I think that that um, some bithering, it would be critical to achieve the goals that, um, that you know, are, are proposed with uh, in terms of astrometric experiments and optical characterization. You'd want to move this pinhole box around. I, I in the artistic rendition, I put it at the bottom of the dark box, but I think it can, can be placed on the XY stage that the pencil beam occupies. And um, so it should, should be able to be translated around. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, another question specifically for Adam or Heian, um, can from Jacques uh, about the tree rings. So specifically, uh, what is the origin of those tree rings and does that like what kind of effect does that have or what magnitude of impact does that have on the images? 
Um, I, I can answer that. So it's due to the silicon low content concentration from the manufacturing process of the wafer. So, uh, like it's you're growing the silicon wafer um, right by radiously, and since the dopant content concentration changes uh, radially, it makes that kind of um, Turing like pattern. Um, does that answer your question? So yeah, it moves the electrons to certain um, directions to make brighter and darker pattern in radial um, directions. And what's the, the magnitude of the impact of those? So um, with the um, bias voltage given for the ITL and E2B sensors, it's less than 0.1%. Uh, and if you go to the more edge of the sensor, it gets worse, but it's within the 0.1% level. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we had a question from Wesley for Adam. How large are the anticipated ast astrometric effects from the sensor compared to the effects of the telescope OTA distortion? Um, could someone tell me what OTA stands for? I don't, I'm not familiar with that acronym. Move assembly. Uh, how much does the uh, effect of the sensor uh, matter compared to the, the distortion caused by bending of the telescope as it moves around on the sky? Oh, okay. Um, I think that, yeah, I, I see that uh, Robert answered it, sort of, and I, I think that's really the answer, because um, I don't, I don't have an, that much knowledge on the size of the OTA distortions. Um, but the, the, the things that we're looking for with sensor effects are, as you can see on this image here, are uh, sub-pixel level distortions. So they're very small. And, and as of now, really, the only major uh, component that uh, really needs to be, well, that is corrected is the edge, edge distortions. Um, so things like the tree ring magnitude here is uh, at 0.02 pixels. And uh, and maybe the sen the segment sensor or the uh, the midline break. So these are really really small distortions. Um, I, I, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a a number to compare those two with the what what you would expect from the distortion, the movement of the sensors under you know gravity and, and things like that. But hopefully that gives you kind of an idea of the scale. To hey, Margo, I can I can add to that if you wish. Go for it. Yeah, so um, I think um, so. The the inherent distortion of the optics of the telescope and camera together is um, one part in ten to the four, one part in ten to the minus four across the entire field of view. Um, and, but I think the 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 if I can extrapolate the question, I think the relevant question is is how stable that that pattern is because um, the stable portion of that pattern will of course be um, subtracted and removed by uh, the astrometric solutions from the, uh, the data analysis. And so as far as we can tell right now, based on the, um, the so let me, let, let me back up a little bit. So the, the control needed uh, for the telescope and camera optics to maintain image quality uh, far supersedes the control needed to maintain astrometric stability. So the astrometric stability is going to be another maybe two, maybe even three orders of magnitude down below the inherent distortion just to maintain image quality. So the image quality is, is the first order effect. The astrometric distortions and, and variability is a second or third order effect. I don't know if that helps. Chuck, maybe if I could just I could just add, if the question was actually related to the, um, the sensors themselves, uh, the sensors are spring-loaded onto their um, silicon carbide base plates, which are spring-loaded onto a silicon carbide grid. The sensors themselves are, are not, are not going to be uh, noticeably moving at all from, from any kind of gravitational. The flexing of the camera and stuff, as Chuck suggested, and the telescope will be taken out, as Chuck suggested, but the actual motion of, this, of the sensors themselves will be negligible for sure.
Thank you to everyone for helping with that question. Um, I don't see any other questions uh, coming in right now, but uh, feel free to either unmute yourself and join the conversation or uh, type in a question and I will call on you. Um, Margo, hi. Yes. Uh, can I extend my previous question to find out these, these three rings, if I understand, it does that mean they are stable because they are like in the silicon so they don't change with time? Is that correct? Yes. As long as you keep the back bias, um, the effect is uh, constant. You can think of it as small electrostatic distortions um, and they, are they should be absolutely stable. Thank you. And we're lucky our bulls are, happen to be uh, such that this is a very low, very small effect in all of our sensors. There are other observatories with much larger uh, tree rings. Uh, just another, because I look at it, does that mean that they all have, is it based on the rate of, of um, expansion or no expansion, but the rate of, what's the right word, growth, if you would like, of the silicon that we see? So it's the same frequency, a special frequency, basically for all the sensors? I'm happy to answer, but maybe some of our speakers would prefer to answer first. I can, I can try and answer that one. Um, I think it, it is, it's very directly related to the growth conditions of the silicon pool from which all the CCDs are then, you know, sliced out of. Um, so really, yeah, the frequency and the amplitudes is sort of set by those pr pr procedures, which are a little bit of a dark box because we don't really know the exact manufacturing process, but it is pretty consistent frequency and amplitudes across uh, the, the, the sensors. And in fact, I think it's pretty consistent even between ETV and, and ITL, um, which are two different manufacturers. They use the CCDs from the same uh, founding fund, foundry? I, I don't actually know for certain if they do. No. But no, physically. Um, and the, what matters here is who provides the bull, the actual silicon. Yeah. Can, can I make a small comment, maybe? I, I mean, um, he owns the expert, of course. But I just wanted to say, from, from the point of view of, of, of someone whose background is device modeling, right? First of all, this is exotic silicon. This is bulk, sometimes greater than 15 kilo ohm. This is not your norm. This is not like your epitaxial grown thin sensor stuff that you find in, in, in regular cameras nowadays. So that's your first worry. But the second worry with tree rings for me was always not necessarily that they're static electrostatically, but what they represent is changes in res resistivity at the back surface of the CCD. And the scary thing about that is the thing you always gonna you always assume when modeling these thick CCDs is that your back surface is essentially constant resistivity. If what you're interested in is a field shape in the device, what you can imagine is that if you have big changes in resistivity at the back surface, then those field lines are not necessarily pinned to be parallel at the back surface. Now it turns out that that's not a problem, but you know, a few years ago, I, I, it was quite a worry that that might be a problem, even if it's static, but you know, it seems to be fine. But thank you for the answers. Maybe Heyun would like to. I, I shouldn't have jumped in. Maybe Heyun. <laughs> would, uh, oh yeah, and I was going to mention that like uh, E2B and ITL are using the same um, manufacturers for the wafer, silicon wafer. So that's why it has similar um, Turing's effect. And uh, the freq for the frequency, it changes frequency and amplitude. It changes along the radius. Um, it's in the paper if you are um, interested. Um, like I showed the relation between the radius with the amplitude and the frequencies and the orientations also. Uh, so we are, well, thank you, Heyun, And we are just about out of time. Um, so Let's give a round of applause to all of the speakers. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, and thank you to everyone who dialed in to listen. And uh, we have about a 15 minute break until the next session. So potentially see you there. Bye all, thank you very much.